Hi, I'm Dr. Rachel Dolan. I'm a movement disorder specialist and lifestyle medicine physician at the Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's Research. Today, we're going to be talking about the gut. The gut is strongly connected to the brain and has a big role in our brain health and also in brain disease like Parkinson's. So we'll talk about the gut-brain connection and what you can do to keep your gut healthy, to keep your brain healthy, or to manage disease like Parkinson's. We're joined by Dr. Wael El Nashif, who's a gastroenterologist and researcher with expertise in Parkinson's. Wael, thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me. So let's jump in because we've got a lot to cover. The gut. We might think about that and talk about it in different ways, like I have a gut feeling or I've got an upset stomach, but what actually is the gut? So to me, the gut is an, a simple term to refer to the gastrointestinal tract. And that includes everything from your upper throat all the way down to the anus. The organs that are in, included in that include the esophagus, the food tube, your stomach, your small intestine, and your colon. And we think about it as far as digesting our food, right? But it does a lot more than that. Yeah, so the, the GI tract is amazing. It's why I got into the field. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, aside from just absorbing and digesting food, it's the largest hormone producing organ. It's the largest absorptive service in the body. It's the largest community of bacteria in our body. And it's the second largest neurological organ. And that's second to the brain. Of course. Yeah. yeah. And it's connected to the brain. Yeah. So um, although the intestinal tract can function independently, if you took it out into a tissue bath, it would have all these muscle contractions, mm -hmm. et cetera. Really, in order for it to function properly, it has to be wired to the central nervous system or brain. There's multiple connections throughout the GI tract and, and the brain. Uh, and this is really important because it's not just a one-way uh, uh, communication. There are signals from the brain that go to the gut, and the gut can signal to the brain. And we experience this in our everyday lives, right? Like if I have an upset stomach, maybe I don't feel as well, and vice versa. We, we experience this brain-gut talking to each other. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, a lot of people refer to the, to the gut as the second brain, hmm. really. So there's really two brains talking to each other. So sometimes in some people, mm -hmm. it may be a place where disease could, for example, start in the gut. Yeah. Like we, we're learning yeah. that in some people, disease Parkinson's might start in the gut and actually then move to the brain. Yeah. Um, so that's one way that the gut and brain are really connected. But we also see it with, you know, a lot of people with Parkinson's experience things like constipation mm -hmm. or other changes. So we certainly see how a disease that affects the brain like Parkinson's can also impact the gut. Yeah, so this is, you know, you're, this brings up a really interesting uh, advance in the research of Parkinson's. And there's a growing theory that, at least in some patients with Parkinson's, the disease first starts in the gut and then travels to the brain over many years. It's through that, those communications between the brain and the gut that this can happen. And as we learn more about this, this could potentially be a way where we could learn how the disease is coming on, maybe even prevent it from spreading further. Yeah, so uh, there's a lot of potential here. It's very exciting research, but it's still very early days. And we'll talk a little bit more about what can go wrong in the gut with Parkinson's, but I want to talk about the microbiome for a second, sure. because so many people wonder, you know, you mentioned all the important aspects of what the gut does for us. It also plays a role in our immune system, right? Our like fighting disease, um, making nutrients and vitamins. But the microbiome, tell us a little bit more about what that is and why it's important. So yeah, the, the microbiome refers to the population of bacteria that live, normally live in your intestinal tract. In everybody. And it's normal, this is not an infection. These are the bacteria that you know, have co-evolved with humanity over you know, the centuries. Uh, and they, they uh, don't live rent-free. <laughs> they provide functions, you know, their byproducts are, uh, can be absorbed and, and have beneficial effects and help us maintain a healthy life. If, uh, if the population of the bacteria, because not, it's not all the same bacteria, there's different types of bacteria. If that gets out of uh, balance, that can lead potentially to harmful effects. And we refer to this as dysbiosis, you might see that term. Um, in Parkinson's, we've learned that, uh, uh, and several studies have shown, that the populations of bacteria in their intestines is different than what we see in patients who don't have Parkinson's. Whether or not this is cause or effect is still too early to say, 
but it's a very interesting uh, potential. And so exactly what you're saying is we don't yet know, we know there's differences in the microbiome in people who have Parkinson's, but we don't know if that's causing Parkinson's or it's from the Parkinson's. Exactly. And there are so many things that can affect our microbiome, whether we have Parkinson's or not. The, the foods we eat, where we live, whether we exercise, the medicines we take. Yeah, and it also depends on the, how the gut is functioning. So if the gut is slowed down, it's gonna change how frequently you clear out your gut and that will affect what, which bacteria reproduce. So speaking of the gut slowing down, let's talk about that and how that happens in Parkinson's. Parkinson's can affect the gut in so many ways and we often think about constipation because that's one of the most common symptoms. So let's start with that but then talk about the other things that can happen. Sure, so a lot of evidence suggests that the nerves in the gut itself can be affected by Parkinson's. And this usually results in things slowing down, meaning the contractions are slowed down or weakened and the movements are slower. So just like our overall movements can slow down, our walking can slow yeah. down, our gut slows down too in Parkinson's. Yeah, exactly. So this plays out in different ways depending on which organ in the GI tract is affected. Uh, so if it's in the colon, if it slows down, that leads to constipation. In the stomach, that can cause uh, delayed gastric emptying or gastroparesis. In the small intestine, this can lead to something called SIBO or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And different symptoms with different with each of these different areas affected. Exactly. And so, um, if you have uh, gastroparesis or your stomach is emptying slower, then you might notice you eat a couple of bites of food and you feel full immediately, or you feel like there's a brick sitting in your stomach. This might prevent you from eating a full meal. Um, if your colon is slowed down, constipation. If you have uh, SIBO, or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, this can lead to bloating. So all kinds of different symptoms also really impacts how well our medicine does or doesn't work. So this is something that I've uh, uh, observed over time with patients, and I think it's very important and, and also just interesting to think about it uh, because it can lead to uh, differences and changes in how we manage these problems. Um, so what I often will see is a patient who has, let's say, gastric, gastroparesis or gastric, delayed gastric emptying. And this patient will uh, also tell me that they've uh, had increasing doses of their levodopa, mm -hmm. increased frequency of their levodopa, but it doesn't seem to kick in as quickly. It doesn't seem to last as long. And, uh, but once we address their gastric emptying, though their absorption of levodopa improves. Uh, and my theory, my thought on this is that uh, we, we uh, uh, will often prescribe the levodopa and tell patients to time their levodopa around, uh, away from their meals because protein in your diet will inhibit the absorption of the, will in interfere with the absorption of the drug. Yeah, so they get absorbed in the same place. So oftentimes if you take your levodopa with eating a big protein meal, we mm. say that you know they might compete and you might not absorb as much medication. But what you're saying is there are other things that can happen that can impact how well our medicine is absorbed too. Yeah, so for example, when we tell a patient, you know, take your levodopa an hour before or after a meal, for example, we're assuming that their stomach is emptying normally. Mm. And the big problem though is if you have Parkinson's with delayed gastric emptying, your stomach may never be empty hmm. completely. So taking higher doses or more often doses may not be the answer. Exactly, and so they're always gonna have this protein interfering unless we deal with the underlying mm. problem, which is the slowed stomach. And important to stress, this doesn't happen in everybody. This yeah. interaction isn't a big deal in everybody, but in some people it really is. Exactly, so it's always important to say this, this is for a subset of patients, it could be true. It's not universally the case. And weight loss is another one that can happen in Parkinson's. Yeah, so there's many reasons for weight loss in Parkinson's. It can be related to the gastroparesis that we discussed already, or having to take levodopa so frequently that there's li literally no time to eat. Mm -hmm. Or uh, for many patients, they attribute their, their GI symptoms to food and they start restricting their diet, saying, oh, this food causes bloating, this food causes pain, et cetera, et cetera. And they end up just restricting themselves down to almost nothing. Mm. And they're subsisting off saltine crackers. I've seen this many times. And I think it's important in those cases for patients to take a step back and maybe uh, speak with a specialist or a dietitian to help them figure out what foods they do tolerate and to also importantly determine whether their symptoms are really due to the food 
or due to some of these other issues we've discussed. And a lot of people understandably will treat a lot of these symptoms with over-the-counter medications, right? We can get laxatives or stool softeners or any, any number of things to help mm. us with a lot of these symptoms. And that's okay to a point, right? Mm. And then you wanna seek specialist help. Yeah, so I think it's always good to start uh, you know, with, with these over-the-counter measures because it, you can do this right away on your own and they're generally very safe. Um, stool softeners, I'll say though, oftentimes are too small of a gun. By the time, mm -hmm. you know, if you have Parkinson's and constipation, I would probably not even bother with them. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, other medications like osmotic laxatives, such as uh, a brand name Miralax or PEG is, is the generic, um, that is extremely safe and very effective for many patients. And you can take this every day and it's, it's you know, totally fine if it works for you. Um, a lot of patients ask me about uh, stimulant laxatives. These are things like um, uh, bisacodyl or Senna. Uh, these medications I think are fine to use, but they often cause cramping and other side effects. And so if you find yourself needing to take a stimulant laxative more than let's say once a week, uh, then you should consider speaking to a specialist um, because they can help you find a regimen that's gonna be better tolerated. And don't wait. You're, you're talking yeah. about these symptoms can really impact how our medicine works, our, how we interact with other people, whether we go out to eat or, mm -hmm. you know, just impact quality of life in general. So don't wait. Talk yeah. to your doctor. See a specialist like you. There are even motility gut specialists that you can look for to help you with these problems. Yeah. So, you know, I think patients, you know, will say, when should I see a specialist? And I, I always say probably sooner than you, mm. than you thought. Because Specifically with Parkinson's population, I feel that um, many patients may have psychologi psychologically accepted that their life's just going to be hard, and this is just part of the deal. Um, and I, I think that's very unfortunate because there's a lot of things we can do for the GI symptoms, and really we can we can oftentimes make patients feel pretty regular again. Mm. Um, and so obviously, um, you know. If you're having red flag symptoms like bleeding, severe abdominal pain, if you're unable to eat food or drink water, those are all definitely need to see a specialist right away. Um, but if you're having symptoms that aren't responding to over-the-counter therapies and you're still having symptoms, don't just uh, accept that. Yeah. You know, seek care from there. Yeah, it doesn't have to be that way and there's yeah. a lot of things that we can do. Mm -hmm. Wael, thank you so much. You gave us so many good insights, so much good information, and we really appreciate you being here today. My pleasure. The gut is such an important part of our brain health and part of living with disease like Parkinson's. We hope you learned a lot from this video and that you feel empowered to take action in your journey with Parkinson's. You can learn more about this and other topics in life with Parkinson's by visiting our website. Mm -hmm.